right, I've got a bunch of photos I'd like to show you and a thing. That's okay. So this is me. I'm obsessed with caffeine. And I do, it makes me do strange things. That's basically all we need to know. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to show you, I think has captured my imagination quite a bit. Um, with the captioning concept of it being wearable, I think the first thing that most people think about is a product that has sketchy history. Uh, Google made something called Google Glass, and it didn't quite make it into the mass market. And it's mostly for social reasons, not because of technical reasons. Uh, the idea that you would have something that was wearable, that would constantly be uh, sending what it saw to the cloud and God knows who else. Uh, some people thought that was not a very good social environment to be in. And so the social response to that was to change the name of the product, uh, which effectively killed it. But it didn't entirely die. So Google Glass was 2015, and I know it seems like a long time ago because of COVID, um, but that was when it was conceived of. Um, and 2017, it made a reappearance. It came back two years later, but not as uh, a live streaming creepy tool. Uh, instead, they tried to introduce it to uh, enterprise. And so Google Glass is available, but not to the consumer. So if you are an enterprise and you have uh, a need for it in, I don't know, uh, manufacturing or maybe training or something like that, where you need a heads up display uh, or you need your hands free to do something while looking at something, then Google actually does provide it. And the cost price is about a thousand US dollars. So it is available. It came to my attention because in the last, uh, couple of years I've been trying to make uh, tech accessible to persons with disabilities. So tech for the purpose, tech for purpose, that's the hashtag. Um, so this article, which is from IEEE, points to uh, the use case where they were trying to see how this kind of device would be useful for children with a specific kind of disability. Um, because the tech is already there, they've done the necessary engineering behind it, uh, so put it to good use. And I thought this was a good idea, but the problem I had with this was the price tag. Um, so the people I was working with in Singapore um, also found that this was not accessible. It's an accessibility device, but it's financially prohibitive. It's not affordable, so strangely inaccessible. So do what you know hackware and hackers do. Uh, we take the part and try and find a low cost alternative to something that's available in the market for something you can't afford. Uh, and that is the approach that I think a lot of people in this room will resonate with. So the question then became, what's inside Google Glass? And um, I Google that, turns out this picture came up and it says at the bottom, it's surprisingly simple. I don't know about you, but some people would find that surprisingly simple, others mostly people like me didn't think that that was particularly simple, especially the thing in the corner over there, it says objects. <laughs> but if you worked with lenses and things, it's not exactly simple to make that happen. It looks like there are a few parts, but there's a lot of engineering that goes in behind it. So if you want to make something that's wearable like this and has a piece of glass that is right in front of you, you can try this now. You hold your finger or anything, you hold your phone, this close to your eye, you will not be able to read it. Physically, it's impossible for your eye to focus on something that's floating this close. The best you can do is somewhere here. And that's like the nearest distance that you can see. So the question was, can we do it without the optics? And it turns out we can. All you have to do is get a display screen and stick it far away from your face. <laughs> and so we tried it. Did one in open scat, which I think some people were really like. Um, and we prototyped it. And we came up with a Raspberry Pi as a really nice way to do that. It's a Pi Zero W. And the total cost price came down by a factor of 10, so less than $100. This is a generous number. I mean, if you uh, add up all the component parts in there, it's probably going to cost a lot less. But we're not factoring in the time to print and the time to design and all of those sorts of things. But I think 
think generously, we could probably sell it for $100. So this is what we have here. It's 3D printed. It's got a Raspberry Pi on the side, and it's got a display screen, and it uses high-tech space-age technology to hold it all together. <laughs> which is a bunch of plastic. And uh, anybody want to guess what this is? It's black stuff. I'd love to say that, yes, you're absolutely right. It's carbon fiber, but it's not. It's even cheaper than that. It's a dollar for this two meter. This is 50 cents per meter. And it's very commonly used around Singapore and Southeast Asia. When you're angry with somebody, there's a phrase. You tell them to go fly kite. And it's used for big size kites. You go to a kite store, and there are a few in Singapore where you can buy this material uh, for 50 cents a meter. And it's very easy to work with. You can chop it with a pair of scissors uh, and stick it into your 3D printed uh, parts, put some screws in, and you've got a wearable that is highly customizable and puts a screen within your field of vision. And if you connect that screen to a Raspberry Pi, You've got that screen displaying anything you want from the internet. So the design of this was so that it would be modular enough that we could tailor it to individuals. Because remember, I mentioned that I was trying to work with uh, persons with disabilities. So as cool as this makes me look right now, which I know everybody wants one in the room, um, it was meant for people who were either um, hearing impaired or users of hearing aids. And so we designed it so that it would. Uh, allow for it to be personalized, so individualized. So this nose piece would only fit one person, the ear piece would only fit according to the person's need, and everything else is kind of interchangeable. So that's what we did. Um, I'm forgetting something. Yes, the wiring is uh, intentionally left uh, for cool factor and because it's a prototype, so it's exposed. Um, but the end result is you get a screen that is visible within your field of vision. And it's lightweight enough that it doesn't cause too much of a problem. The challenge then became how do you power this thing long enough for it to be useful? Also, what does it do? If you want to have captions and you want to see something, what is it actually going to show on the screen? I mean, if you're watching a YouTube video, all you have to do is press a button and you can see the captions on it. So no big deal, right? If you're watching a video anyway. So, but this is meant for real life video, um, which some of us struggle with. But if you get somebody saying something and your hearing aid is barely able to pick it up or it's drowned out by white noise or somebody else speaking, it really helps to have captions within the field of view. And now if you talk to people who are deaf or hard of hearing or hearing impaired, they use an app on their phone. So they usually have it out here and then they listen to what people are saying and then they just see it on the phone. So that's the current state of how people with hearing impairments work. So this was trying to push that boundary and see if we can make it right. So that was the intention. Uh, it's supposed to have a little microphone at the end of it. Uh, so it picks up what is being said, sends it to the Google Cloud, uses a speech-to-text engine, and then screens back the text in real time so you can see the captions of what's being said. So that's what we call IHEAR. Several prototypes. Uh, this was the chopstick prototype, which is important to point out because it literally has a chopstick in it. Uh, it's actually easier to work with chopsticks than 3D printing everything. Uh, that is what inspired this material. If we never used a chopstick and 3D printed everything, we would never come up with this. Pro tip there, use chopsticks. The display is not particularly fancy. Uh, it is what you normally use when you want to have a tiny little version and you don't want to break the bank. This is like I don't know, $12. Uh, and you plug it into the Raspberry Pi. Again, all standard stuff, nothing particularly uh, scary. Uh, you follow the standard tutorials, you plug in your Raspberry Pi Zero, and you get your display working. Um, this, I just put it up here because uh, we tried to watch YouTube on the tiniest possible screen possible. And it turns out, you know, it is, it's got a web browser, it's got you know, a full Raspberry Pi OS interface. You can watch the YouTube video. You do need a magnifying glass, but it can be done. So that's the screen that, that's, that's hovering in front of me. Um, so yeah, it helps uh, engage with other makers, but the key person you want to work with is somebody who uses a hearing aid on a day basis. So we worked with uh, a number of people who volunteered uh, from the Singapore Association of Deaf. They came in, they thought it was a very cool idea. 
very few people engaged with sharing their users. And very quickly, we found out where we made all the mistakes. Because you, you, know, you think about uh, making this thing with all the tools that you have, you often overlook what it's going to be, how it's going to be used. But when you have something lightweight and more modular enough, you can invite people who are actually going to use it and learn from them straight away. So we, what we found out when we talk, uh, spoke to the hearing aid users is that this ear piece gets in the way of the actual hearing aid. And what you want is something complementary. You don't want it to replace the hearing aid. So we um, got feedback from this person and he said, you know what, try it strap. And so we got rid of these bits. We just pulled them off and then we put a strap instead. And that worked out beautifully for him. But somebody else who tried it said that they were quite okay with it. Um, and so we left it like without the strap. So it depends on the individual user and how they use it. And because you have a modular design, you can come up with things on the fly. All you need is, you know, cable tie and duct tape. You can solve pretty much all of the world's problems. Okay, so that's um, something we call I hear. And this is a prototype that is now I'm still actively working on. If somebody wants to join in, let me know after the talk and I will get you of that. Um, part two is we took this idea and we did a, bra a fork. Um, and instead of having something personalized and individualized for each individual user, uh, there was a request from these people. Uh, they all are in Singapore. It's a collective of theater people. So Esplanade, SRT, National Library, places like that, that do performance arts, like on the stage. And they liked this idea and they wanted to do something that would allow for hearing impaired or people who use hearing aids to go and watch a live theater performance without having to download a special app. So they could pick up something and wear it and then watch the show, leave it behind and then go away. That was the intention. Um, so we started working on it and being an open source uh, approach and an open source uh, project, we were able to draw inspiration from community responses. Now, uh, this is a common site around the world, not just in Singapore. Uh, medical workers responding to the pandemic situation. This is a picture from 2020 when we ran out of personal protective equipment. And uh, some people in Singapore decided to put up their hand and said, you know what, I want to try and help. I'm a geek. I don't know how to do medical stuff, but I have a 3D printer. So how can I help? And it turns out it's not just in Singapore, everywhere people started printing things. So this is the producer design. It's downloadable, tested and printed uh, millions of times around the world. Uh, there are different ideas that came out, you know, before this one settled on. But this is the one that is highly printable, uses the least amount of material and lasts the longest. I printed this in 2020 and it's still totally flexible and wearable. So this is where the face shield would go. So we drew inspiration from this idea and turned it into this. So you can see this. literally that um, has uh, intimate relations with this and produces an offspring which is a fork, hardware fork, of exactly the same concept. And it's highly wearable. You don't have to um, personalize anything. It's all very, you know, generic. And it has more 3D printed parts. And this is not staying in place because, you know, prototypes. It needs more duct tape, in fact. But it's the same screen. Uh, and I've designed this to be a little bit adjustable. So you can move it, like, you know, in front or further away and this thing telescopes in and out a little bit. But the idea is exactly the same. I'm gonna try and turn this thing on. Oh, look, it actually works. Um, later on, after the talk, you can have a look. It will try and connect to Wi-Fi and fail, but you can actually see um, some text on the screen. It is entirely open source because, you know, I don't know how to do, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to do advanced CAD, so, I'm sure somebody recognizes which software this is made on. Anybody? Tinkercad, thank you very much. Yes. It's the same sort of 3D design software that you use for to introduce CAD to children. If you want to customize a keychain with a 3D printer, then you use Tinkercad. 
And it turns out you can push the boundary for taking CAD quite a lot, and you can come up with something like this and work with uh, theater professionals and get um, people, actual hearing impaired users, out into the field to watch the performance using a prototype that was made on Figure CAD. So this is um, where the project is right now. We call it this play screen, because it sounds like this play screen, but it's about plays. Thank you. I'll take that. So it's a working title, but anybody wants to get involved, please do, because the, the play that this was written for is the text that you're seeing on the screen here. Uh, and it was performed outdoors. And if you think about it, uh, stage performances, when you have hearing impaired people in the audience, they put up some kind of a screen where they show subtitles in a live stage. But if you have an outdoor performance, these two are actors who are performing outside, you can't really carry around the big TV screen to show people subtitles. And so a lot of people who are here in the don't have a go and participate in these sorts of uh, fun and interesting performances. So that was a unique opportunity. And we were able to involve a lot of uh, people um, in this kind of like prototyping process. So it's not just about hardware. It's not just about like, you know, being clever with uh, open source. It is about involving persons with disabilities in your sort of design process. I'd love to show this video if possible, but that is not happening. Okay. Um, what we learned very quickly when we had people wearing these things and walking around was that it allowed for uh, somebody who has a hearing aid to keep their hearing aid uh, on and they were able to watch the show, exclusively the show, because it only has a script. It's not like I hear, which has like, you know, whatever people are saying, it live transcribes. This one only displays the script that is performed by the actors. And so it doesn't get in the way of your other interactions with people around them. Um, so there's a little video uh, of people standing around each other. They're all different hearing aid users, and they were able to communicate with each other while the performance was going on. And unlike us, hearing impaired users are able to communicate without making a sound because they use sign. And when you use sign, you use your hands. So we realized that completely accidentally. It wasn't like the like main thing we could think about when we started designing this. So we gave it to them. They were like, yeah, you know, this is good. Or this is it. That. And it was really nice. So um, the design process involves users. We learn things that we don't normally expect. Also, it's got clear cool factor. A lot of people wanted to take the picture of the thing while they were wearing it, <laughs> while the performance was going on. So the people who participated in this trial uh, had a lot of fun. So this is what we call this play screen. Um, it started off with, you know, Nothing but uh, a standard bunch of uh, electronics that you would find in a hack space. I'm sure a lot of people have been thinking on various kinds of electronics, uh, but this is where it is now. I, um, it, it's, the trial is complete. SRT is very happy with the success of uh, this one prototype, but um, like Arsh's uh, prototype, we only made five. You only made three of yours. So right now there are only five that exist. Um, I'd love to increase that count, but I need all the help that I can get. I want to try and you know optimize the power consumption, change the change the capability of what you can do with the, the screen, because it is full color, and all we're using it right now is for text. So one of the uh, people who participated in the thing, um, they were not deaf, but they were speaking. They actually uh, said you can on the same device have people showing videos off sign. You don't have to show text. And sign has this beautiful advantage that it's not in English. You can sign language. Uh, it's a language of, on its own. So it transcends language. The other suggestion that a lot of people have was you, you can show different languages with the same text. So that's where we are. We're doing this. If you want to know more about uh, the trial, uh, it's on SRT's website. If you scan the QR code, it will take you to the link tree of the thing that I'm doing, and it's got all of this stuff. Um, my contact is over there, and I want to end this off. Am I okay with that? Yeah.
I want to end this off very quickly with a request um, for donors for the makerspace. So the place that we've been trying out all this sort of stuff for this is the tech. Uh, we want to uh, keep it going, but we only have until the end of this year. Uh, so please do donate. And one last request, if there's anybody in the room who has worked with wireless antenna design or knows somebody who is good at this, please talk to Michael later on. Okay, thanks very much.